Hello. Hello. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Hunter J. Fassois Library for Author Talk. It is my pleasure this afternoon to be some sort of a moderator. My name is Natalie Julie Fanis, and I am the head of the Marketing and Communications Unit here at the South of the Woods Community College. And I ask that you please allow me to recognize our honored guests. I would first like to recognize the distinguished author who will be presenting today, Sir Calix George. Welcome, sir. <laughs> and thank you for accepting our, of our offer to be here. I would also like to recognize the chair of the board of the South of the West Community College, Mr. Cynthia Springer, our vice principal of academics, our um, librarian here with us and who is the main organizer of activities for the National Library Week, Mrs. Kathy abuchi McDiamond. Here with us also this afternoon is the Director of the Public Library Services, as well as the President of the Kiwanis Club of St. Lucia. We have former library staff here. And let me also take the opportunity to recognize our celebrated writers. Ms. Donald Dixon is here, Mr. Kara. I'm using your, your Calypso name. Thank you so much for being here with us and other distinguished guests. 
students and staff of the South Lewis Community College, a special welcome to all of you to this activity here in recognition of National Library Week for 2023. And our very own Hunter J. Fassois Library is a forerunner in the activities, always pushing and celebrating and, uh, and making us understand the importance of libraries and the relevance of libraries, even at this time when you think it may not be so. So as part of the activities for National Library Week, the Hunter J. Fassois has organized a series of talks author talks, and we've had two previous talks with McDonald Dixon, who's here with us today, as well as Kendall Hippolyte. And today we are going to be um, listening to Mr. Sir Calix George, and later this week, I'll put in a plug right away on Friday, we will have author Rick Wayne. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to invite one of our students to do the formal introduction of Sir Calix before he makes his presentation. Kishana Smith. Good afternoon, everyone. Calix George was born in St. Lucia and had his early education at the Roman Catholic Boys' School before attending the premier secondary school on the island, St. Mary's College. He graduated from St. Mary's in 1958, having attained both the Cambridge School Certificate Division I and Cambridge University Higher Certificate. At the Cambridge School Certificate level, he obtained distinctions in chemistry, botany, and mathematics, and became the first student to gain three distinctions in science subjects at one sitting. At the higher school certificate level, he concentrated on science-based subjects and was among the first group of St. Lucian students to pass three science subjects, chemistry, botany, and zoology in 1958. From an early age, the young George had acquired skills for the science-based subjects, and he continued further education at the University of the West Indies, UE Trinidad, where he graduated in 1963, gaining a Bachelor's of Science in Agriculture. He was among the first cohort of students of the University of the West Indies to graduate with a degree in Agriculture. In 1964, he entered University of Reading and attained a Master's in agricultural science in soil science with specialty in soil chemistry. Sir Calix started his working career as a junior science master at St. Mary's College in the year 1959. From there, he worked for two years before proceeding to further his studies at university level. He then worked as an agronomist at Windward Islands Banana Research. Later, he joined the Ministry of Agriculture where he served as research officer and on occasions as Chief Agricultural Officer. In 1979, he joined the regional organization Caribbean Agricultural Research and Development Institute, CARDI, as head of the local unit. Then, in 1988, he was made project manager of CARDI, USAID Farming Systems Research and Development Project, and had a responsibility for all the OECS countries. He also served in the capacity as Deputy Executive Director and from 1990 to 1993 was the Executive Director of CARDI, having to relocate at headquarters in Trinidad. Upon leaving CARDI, Sir Calix worked as the Managing Director of the St. Lucia Banana Growers Association and Temper Estate and Alvin Estate in St. Lucia. Sir Calix has always kept abreast with political directorates and the politics in St. Lucia and as such, it was in 1979 that he became president of the Senate under the leadership of the St. Lucia Labour Party. Through his medium, he was made the Minister of Communications, Works, Transport and Public Utilities for the period 1997 to 2001. It was under his tenure that St. Lucia and the other OECS countries saw a turn to liberalization of the telecommunications industry in these countries. He was unanimously elected to serve as chairman of the ministers responsible for telecommunications for two consecutive terms. In 2001, when the Labour Party won for the second time, Sir Calix was made the new Minister of Agriculture, Forestry and Fisheries. With his wealth of knowledge and experience in that field, he brought new perspective into that ministry and sought to bring about a revival of the declining banana industry. 
He also directed his energies towards the development of a long-term agricultural development policy and providing strategic approaches for the revitalization of the agricultural industry. After a cabinet reshuffle in early 2004, Sir Calix was transferred from agriculture to the new Ministry of Home Affairs and Internal Security, a ministry which embraced the police, prison, and immigration. Sir Calix has served on the board of a number of professional as well as non-professional organizations, including as a member of the first board of governors of the Sir Arthur Lewis Community College and principal Union Agricultural College, now Division of Agriculture, Sir Arthur Lewis Community College. He has the distinction of having served as executive director and later chairman of the board of governors of a CARICOM institution. Besides being an agriculture research scientist, he is also an ordinary practicing farmer. Sir Calix has also published a number of scientific papers. He recently authored a book entitled St. Mary's College, St. Lucia, West Indies, the Caribbean's Nobel Laureate School, which chronicles with remarkable detail how a secondary school in the backwaters of the British Empire became the alma mater of two Nobel Laureate winners. Sir Calix has received awards for his outstanding contributions to science education, agricultural development, trade unionism, and governance as follows. 1. St. Lucia Medal of Honor Gold. 2. Commander of the Order of St. Michael and St. George. And 3. Knights Commander of the Order of St. Lucia. Ladies and gentlemen, presenting Sir Calix George. can go ahead. Good. <laughs> right, thank you very much um, for that introduction. I didn't think that I'd done so much. I'm very, very pleased to be here um, to give you a slight introduction into my uh, baby, which is um, this book on St. Mary's College. Now, this book came about as a result of St. Mary's um, celebrating her 125th anniversary. And I did give a little talk about St. Mary's. And then the students and masters and everybody uh, indicated that they were surprised uh, of the background that I gave. And they pressured me into writing a book. So I spent four years of my life uh, trying to bring it together, and that is what we have, have here. Um, this this uh, book gives in tremendous detail the beginning of the institution, how the institution came about, uh, and the early life of the institution. Um, during the life of the college, uh, it was, first of all, uh, one has to look at the background, the socioeconomic and educational background of the country. We were, as you know, you heard, heard this thing about British and French, but we are basically French. And in fact, uh, most of the time, we were under the French flag, Asian on the British flag, on the British side, so that the 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 primary uh, elements of the society were French. And then in 1803, I think it was that we became um, British, and continuously from 1814. So the the orientation of the country had to be changed since the British came in. And the British had to make us, you know, like them, became Anglophones. So there's always a tension between the British and the French. And this has had uh, implications because our language really was Patwa. And it took a hell of a, lot of a long time for us to adapt um, to the English way of life and language. 
So St. Mary's, uh, in, in fact, St. Lucia was probably the most illiterate country in the Caribbean at the time. And there were very, very few schools. Uh, the first set of schools were what are known as the Maiko schools, um, one, of, one of which is still, still in existence. That's the one at uh, Rivadori in Chazelle. Uh, that's an a, a example of a Maiko school. And then afterwards, uh, there were church schools. And since we are mainly Roman Catholic, most of the schools um, were run by the, by the, by the um, FMI fathers. Now, when it came to secondary education, we had to send our children, or those who could afford it at the time, either to Martinique, France, or to Barbados and England. And Aries was formed at a time when there was a, a big tussle between French residents and the new uh, British people who came. And so there they was, well, for example, up to the time when I was at school, you were not uh, uh, allowed to speak Patois, right? And you had to learn how to speak English throughout. Uh, so the result is that for a long, very long time, um, English was a kind of a difficult subject up to, up to well, when, when I was in school, uh, a lot of people did not get their certificates because for you to get a certificate in those days, you had to pass English. And, that, and that, was, that, was, that was a very, very big problem. So that was the background of the, the school um, eventually came into existence by a gentleman by the name of Father Louis Tapon, who, as a Frenchman, had to go to England to actually learn English and then uh, started off uh, the school. Now, during the life of the school, um, it started in 1890. So we have about three periods, three epochs. 1890, about 1947, 46, 47. Then you had a second phase, 1970, 1947, um, 46, to about 1975 and then 75 to the current time. Now, during the first period of, of, the, um, of the life of the school, the headmasters, the school was managed by a string of English headmasters, white English guys who came in. Uh, and during that time, uh, the school was fashioned after what, what is known as uh, the grammar schools in England, uh, the, the, the sort of elite schools like uh, Harrow and, you know, these kinds of Winchester. So you had a, a, a classical education. Um, uh, and most of the, or most of the, most of the, um, the principals were from Oxford and Cambridge and, and, and those kinds of universities. They were assisted, however, by a string of Barbadian um, assistant masters. Uh, and that was because Barbados, as you know, was the first uh, British colony. And so they were English in, orienta in orientation from a very early age. And they, they had schools like Harrison and Lodge School. And so those people came. Uh, as assistant masters in our system. Uh, did very well. Um, uh, and in fact, some of them acted as headmasters, but of course, because they were black, there was no way in which they would be made headmaster of St. Mary's College at the time. The headmasters... Um, uh, The different headmasters 
uh, did various things and over a period of time, over a cumulative period of time, it gave the, the whole ethos of, of the school. Um, uh, for example, one of the guys, a fellow called Cruz, Cruz was responsible for the introduction uh, of the spirit of athleticism into the school. And so the first sports day in St. Lucia was held in 1908. And the sports days usually occurred on a Wednesday during the Lenten season, March, April, somewhere around there. Now, that tradition went on for a very long time. Uh, in fact, it was a big thing, more or less. Uh, all the people at Marshall used to uh, clap the boys going up to, 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 um, to, to Victoria Park. Park. Um, for the sports day, and it was, you know, a big social event in the calendar of St. Lucia at the time. Uh, that continued along, and the, the point I'm trying to make is that in a lot of things that happened in St. Lucia, uh, St. Mary's was the first and laid the foundation. So you find out that when um, the Viewfort Secondary School uh, came into existence in the early 60s. One of the headmasters, one of the early headmasters, was Gregor Williams, which I'm sure that you know. And Gregor, being an old boy of St. Lucia, introduced Sports Day in Viewfort. And as you know, Viewfort became and is, in fact, a very uh, good school as far as athletics is concerned. And so that. Uh, gave the impetus for other secondary schools that came into existence. And that is why, for example, in, today, in St. Lucia today, you get you know, athletic sports occurring throughout the educational system, even in the primary schools as well. One of the other headmasters that of, of note was a guy called Fisher, John Desmond Fisher, who was a... Uh, uh, a guy from Cambridge, down in college in Cambridge. And he felt that it was necessary for us to move at a higher level. And so he introduced what is known as the Island Scholarship. He was, he was the, the first to introduce the Island Scholarship. And the Island Scholarship came to existence. It was, um, of course, uh, given one scholarship every two years sometimes every year. Uh, and the first guy that got the scholarship was by the name of Ogis, an Ogis guy who went to, um, to Africa. He, didn't come, he came back to St. Lucia, but then afterwards he, he got a, a job in the British colonial service um, to Africa. So he was the first. But I'll give you some more about these other things. Another headmaster of note, was B.H. Easter. Easter was a young guy who came down and was very, very active. Eventually, he worked in other countries and in Jamaica. And when the University of the West Indies uh, started off the extramural department, he came back to St. Lucia, and then he taught. He was the one who started off the, uh, the archaeological uh, had something from the morn at, at one time. So these guys, uh, they did in fact, they did in fact, um, each gave his little, each gave his little uh, add-on, if you want to call it that way. And so the college uh, survived. The last guy was a guy called Foxy, um, um, Terence Foxalls. And um, he was the last of the English headmasters that ended in 1947. And so after that, the new phase came with the Presentation Brothers of Ireland, which I will uh, deal with uh, in a while. Uh, but before I do that, I want to give you an idea of what transpired 
during those days. And since we're in the, in the Hunter Francois uh, Library, is it? Space, right? Uh, I will give you uh, some references from, from Hunter uh, of his days. Um, to, to give you an idea of um, thing, I'll, I'll read it for you. Um, there's Hunter talking about his days at school. Good old St. Mary's, 1937 to 1941. School fees, 16 shillings and sixpence. Games fees, two English, um, two shillings. Now, that was a difficult amount of money to arrive at, and that's why just a few boys, few parents, could meet that 16 things and sixpence uh, to get a secondary education. English, English literature, French, Latin, geography, history, maps. There was also religious knowledge for the Roman Catholic boys. Games compulsory unless medically certified unsuitable. Three houses, Abercrombie, Rodney, Tapon. Keen competition throughout with Davidson Houston Cup for the highest total points in studies and games combined. Annual concert, speech day, and there were the cadets and sea scouts. And yes, there was the war. Uniform, white shirt and pants and blue blazer with either white helmet or straw hat. Always with school colors attached. We all gathered daily downstairs in Form 4 for the morning roll call, taken as a rule by the headmaster to reply to re replies of Adzum, ranging beyond the octave. This was always somehow amusing. We had T. Fox Hawes, inevitably called Foxy, an Englishman as headmaster throughout the period. I remember him teaching history and English literature and was very keen on the cadet corps and sea scouts. Uh, others included Boxill, Clive Belize, Hilton Andrew, uh, Colin King. And while waiting to go off to the respective island scholarships, Mr. Martin the Saltibus and Mr. Darnley Alexander. Martin the Saltibus, Saltibus was from Sufre, and he was our first dentist. The first dentist. Darnley Alexander, you might have heard about. He became the, the uh, um, Chief Justice of Nigeria. And I'll come to that um, later. There was one scholarship, island scholarship place, as I said, every other year. There were a few radios in those days. Excited crowds gathered around windows to hear the rapid staccato of the distance announcer with the wrong by wrong exploits of Joel Wee. Brown Bomber, one of the first black uh, uh, heavyweight champions of the world. That was next day's hot topic at school and always the war, the war, the war. How were we to know that of these eager disputants, two were later to lose their lives in the RAF, UATN and Desmond Dubole. These are two St. Marians who went to the war and lost their lives. UHN was um, a dark, dark guy, and Tubole was obviously a white guy. They died over Germany. And in fact, um, on Remembrance Days, they still put a wreath uh, in honor of 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 UHN. He was from he was from the ATN family, living at Mondidon. I remember Alan Luisi, head prefect and head of my house to blues. Nick Taylor, Victor Ludorum of Tapon, and Rennie Ravenue, also Victor Ludorum, and a host of others. And there was Eustace, Edinburgh, Edin, Ed, Ed, Edwin Bernays, Joe Begas, etc. Those I remember on going the distance in my form were Roy Auger, Archibald Bastien, Gaspard Blanchard, Basil Dicoto, Evans Drysdale, Owen King, Lynn Lord, Graham Louise, Boniface Monroe, Alistair Sutherland. Quite a mix. With Owen always top of the class and Graham the best all-rounder. Me sometimes in the middle. 
that little form somehow threw up profession-wise two medical doctors, one an FRC, an FRCS, one vet surgeon, one electrical engineer, one surveyor, one lawyer, one history professor, now the pro vice chancellor of the University of the West Indies. He's referring to, of course, to Sir Roy Oje. All right? And of course, you know our hospital was named after Owen. So these were the guys that was there. In those good old days, Byron says in parenthesis somewhere that all days when old are good, we were keenly loyal to our respective houses and proud of our school. There was a general camaraderie, though tempered by lively criticism. If you were to mispronounce a word or produce a howler, this would reverberate throughout the entire school at least a week. We respected the masters and treated the prefects with due circum circumspection. In my form, some not, if not worse, were avid readers, especially fiction. These were the days of, of Zane Gray, Snapper, Leslie Chatteris, you know, the, co the, the contemporary uh, writers of the day, so they were very, very um, uh, voracious readers, more or less. And you know that um, Hunter had this passion for, you know, perfect English. Um, then he talks about, um, there was the matinee and Clark Gable, Humphrey Bogart, some of the old stars, because they used to go to matinee nearly every Saturday uh, at, at cinema. Everybody gathering together, obviously. I don't, I don't know what the making is about the students in town. I mean, this is a traditional thing where students will all, always gather from time immemorial. All this big talk. I don't know why they have this kind of thing and trying to blame students for together. It's obvious that they must get together and so on. Okay, anyway, but that's my point. That's my, my personal view on the matter. Uh, then listen to Hunter there. It is ever fashionable to blame all things on the education system is also pretty boorish. More of thanks and praise. Looking back, we were perhaps an innocent and innocuous lot, neither smoking nor clamoring for student representation. Not like these days, of course, you have marijuana all over the place. Yet somehow the system did contrive to implant in most of us the germ of intellectual curiosity and vision of excellence. If in 1941 we, know, we had no idea that the Black Jacobins had been written in 1938, or even who C.L.R. James was, we would, in due course, find out. If later we were to complain that we had come away with a mistaken sense of the identity, we had yet to add that, by and large, we were equipped with the discipline to make the necessary painful adjustments and adaptations. And so, Counting our blessings, we find them numerous indeed. Good old St. Mary's, how we have loved you. That was the man whom we are uh, in his face today. So that gives you an idea of the type of guys that... Uh, uh, St. Mary's produced. Um, I might not have a, a time to... It's a very interesting story, probably I might, about him and his family. But I, I, hope, I hope I can come to it a little later. Okay, but that was the type of individual that the school bred, a hunter of Maswa.
the thirst for knowledge, excellence, striving for excellence, even if you are not God. All this business about the education system bad and so on. The education system not bad. Not bad, as far as I'm concerned. You go in and you are taught certain things, but you, most importantly, as Hunter would say, you are taught to find out. You can't learn everything. The education system cannot give you everything. What you have to do is to know how to utilize the information that you have been given, no matter what field that you are in, and proceed further. Okay, that's just one example of one guy. I'll give you another example of another guy. Uh, 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 about his... Um, where is it now? Uh, um, this one is Primrose. Okay, let me give you the one about <laughs> one of your la 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 Nobel laureates who is buried somewhere around here. Okay? Uh, if you, if you uh, give me a chance. Okay. The year after I left school, it's an essay he had, wrote, he had written about school leaving. Some of you might have heard about it. I don't know. The year after I left school, a fire destroyed half the town. Now, when I stood on the long wooden veranda of St. Mary's College, I could see cl clearly across the charred pasture of castries to the Vigi Promontory. Now, viewing there was after the fire. What comes to mind? The famous poem which you teach the children, okay, about the fire. That's where the thought came through. You know about the church at sky and all that, okay? Um, that is where the inspiration came through for him to do that thing on the veranda of St. Mary's. College. Um, the the other thing about it, the balcony was a position I had earned as a prefect, but now as an assistant master, I could loiter or strut there if I chose. I run past the headmaster's study which was a sacred ground by our last choleric, absent-minded English Catholic whose name was T.E. Foxhorse. Foxy, as he was called. Foxhorse had also defined the alley back of the college, the lane, you know, the lane between going down to the church, as out of bounds until five minutes before school a decree which sent a schoolboy population in blue serge um, blazers, cock hat and sun, wandering through the town before the bell. Bells obsess the head. He selected his best bell ringer carefully. It was a post more responsible than a prefix. If a wind tilted his bell and the clapper rang lightly, the school shuddered, since Foxy would be out roaring. Who rang the bell? It had been the same with the school balcony, but now Foxy's era, era was over. The 
Irish brothers of the presentation brothers had taken over the college. Despite his short fused temper, we had worshipped Foxy and hated to see him go. So did he. He hated displays of sentiment. So we hung back under the roof of the galvanized iron custom shed, which your father knows, Springer, by a rusty gate and wave when we were sure his ship was headed for England, turning between Latok Point and Viji. Our last English headmaster, he had been a lonely man, devoted to parades, fond of sailing and Conrad's prose, proud of the benignity of his empire. He left the names of battles drumming in us, Blenheim, Waterloo, Malpaquet, of heroes who had actually quartered here. Sir John Moore was up on this same hill here, victim of Corona, Admirals Rodney, Abercrombie, and the graves of an Inisculin regiment on the morn, which is right there, where there were barracks built by the Royal Engineers. Know the barracks, where some of your forms are, with the same rational Romanesque brickwork, brickwork as those at Vigi. Apart from the cathedral, they are our, our, our only architecture. Then there's a rather interesting one on, Ray, on, on Derek himself. He says, I had given up on sports early in the first form because I had been christened a prodigy. prodigy. I, could endure, I couldn't endure failure except it was so ridiculous that it looked like self-sacrifice. I had been considered a promising conventional off-break bowler, but conventional had no promise in it. <laughs> as, as you would say, um, MacDonald. All those promises were a long way behind me. All those angry, urgent crises to leave the life of a young silverfish and get out in the sun and swim. Walcott man. Man, the cry was whatever your age. Get out there and give Abercrombie a point, boy. The important thing, as you know, in St. Mary's is your loyalty to your house. And you must finish the race, even if you come last. Because you've given your house a point. Walcott had tried. Pale, sallow, big-headed, the blue heart of his house blatant on singlet. Stripe of his house running down to kingdom shorts. Flailing away towards the tip. Then how come fat heads? Stop a, des a desperate burst for Abercrombie his own house, to save himself. Alas, what is the point of being a wicked keeper when some full toss meant by an ambitious stylist to be swept to leg just missed my Adam's apple by a gulp? I was so furious that I stretched out flat behind the stumps, playing dead until the team collected around me. Then I rose threw off the gloves and left. Abercrombie had to look elsewhere for points, in essays and in conduct, in addition to the black book, where killings were, killings were noted, and the detention book for minor crimes. Brothers had introduced them. So you could get Alpha, so he gave up the um, playing of the games and concentrated on his writing to give his house the points um, thing. Okay. Um, then he describes, okay. He describes, um, he says that the London Medication, I had filled the, filled the exam once, and I might have won the scholarship 
if, as happened under the brothers, it had been awarded for special subjects. But by the time the highest school was introduced, I was 17 and was too old, so he didn't get the, didn't get the scholarship. Those boys who knew of the hopelessness of their one chance for, for classical education, meant a rep for life in the civil service, grabbed the opportunity to make money working in the oil fields in Curacao. That was the common thing of the college boys, and make it to, to go to Curacao and make up some money so you could get a further education. Uh, he found that the brothers, he loved the, he found the accents of the brothers, he was more sympathetic with the brothers. He had the admiration for Yeats and Joyce, those Irish writers, an atmosphere fortified by those martial Irish tunes that the school choir was taught. I was now consumed by the poetry, whatever expression it took. I shared with one of the brothers uh, who also wrote verse and had composed the new Scott song, a new cynicism for the empire and a passion for certain poets, po poems. So he was influenced, really, by the coming in of the brothers who were Irish. And it's significant because, as you know, Ireland was the first colony of Britain. So the brothers had a kind of sympathy as colonials because they had gone through that same um, cycle. So for, um, for that, and I come now to the second phase, which is the phase of the brothers, which the Irish brothers. And uh, the, the, the brothers, Archbishop of Port of Spain, Count Fimbarayan. Why? Because St. Lucia was part of the dias archdiocese of Trinidad and Tobago at the time. And uh, Fimbarayan was a man from Cork in Ireland, and so he induced the brothers to come down um, to, 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 to St. Lucia, and in the Caribbean, really. The brothers were Catholic, uh, were staunch Catholic educators, uh, and the, the responsibilities, roles and responsibilities of parents and teachers and students and the church was clearly stated uh, by the edict of the, the um, Catholic uh, hierarchy. It says that Christian education takes in the whole aggregate of human life, physical, spiritual, intellectual, and moral, individual, domestic, and several, not with a view to reducing it in any way, but in order to elevate, regulate, and perfect it in accordance with the example and teaching of Christ. So the primary aim, therefore, of the Christian education was to produce true, unfinished men of character. And that is precisely what the Presentation Brothers did. There was a melting of the religious and moral teachings with the academic as well as the athleticism. So it was a combination that produced the product of a Sumerian. And lots of Sumerians 
uh, would tell you that those principles, those principles, those moral principles infused into you, those uh, principles that teach you to fight, for example, on the cricket field or on the football field against grown men and the college boys had to uh, fight their way through if you're playing uh, against police, you know, big men kind of thing. Uh, so you grew up knowing how to fight, how to fight adversity and so on. And that gave you the spirit of a Sumerian. Now, one of the most important aspects of the presentation brothers was that the headmaster, Brother Canis Collins, was a scientist of the highest order. And he was the one who introduced science education to St. Lucia for which we are extremely grateful. If he had not brought in science education to St. Lucia at that time, we would still be in a classical world. And so he, more than anybody else, um, was responsible for the modernization of St. Lucia's education system. He was also, again, a fighter because um, he saved half the town from fire in 1948. Because when the fire was raging, he and his college boys saved the balance of the town for which he was recognized, his firefighting skills. And the third thing that he was famous for is that when he came and found the condition of the school, he says that it was too small, and so he wanted a free, large place. And that is why the college is now at VG because he had identified the place where it is there now as the site for an educational institute. However, he was delayed by the fire because that same building was used for, you know, putting in the people for after the fire had occurred, there was need for space for the, um, the people who were affected. So that's where they lived. Uh, they were transferred up to, to VG. And it was afterwards when they started to build the CDC buildings, when it was finished, around 1951-52, then the college went up to um, to VG. So there was a four-year four year hiatus between when he conceived of going up to the college and when it actually occurred because they, you know, they had to do the CDC buildings. Um, oh, yes. So, yes, when we went in 1952, I spent one term down in the old college and then we transferred up in 1952. That, that was when it is when they went into the new area. And so the college now had oh, beautiful laboratories, um, open space for athletics, tennis, hostel, and so on. There was a hostel for the boys who had to come from the coast. Those people who came from, um, like him, from Viewfort, they had to find places to live in castries and so on. In those days, of course, 
coming from Beaufort. <laughs> it was like going to o'clock in the morning, get the whole bus back to this. And it took about three hours to come to Castries. Okay. Um, when uh, Collins left, um, when, oh yes, one of the, one of the important things that Collins did too in introducing science was that he insisted that we did agricultural science. And so you find there was a whole host of us doing the science subjects. And it became very handy, really, because the development of St. Lucia, when the banana development of St. Lucia occurred, all right, it was driven by the college boys. So all of the roads and the, um, and, and, the, and the areas that you have growing bananas and other commodities in St. Lucia today, because it was the industry that actually provide this infrastructure that you all are enjoying today, was affected by the college guys who had studied agricultural science and provided the technical information necessary for the growth of the industry. So you find that, oh, I mentioned the names, you have people like Sir Francis Leos, you have myself, for example. I did the first ex size, size set of experiments to determine the fertilizer requirements for the growers. What fertilizer are you going to give the growers to grow, to, to put for your bananas? So you had to develop, do the experimentation in different agroecological zones of the country to determine the formulation and things. Uh, then you have Dr. Edmonds, who was a nematologist and so on, um, who, who came there. And your dad, who worked at Wimban, right, uh, in the early days with the Messings and so on, who was a chemist and gave all the technical information to the farmers. Okay? But, but while on that, I will also say, and that is one of the things that they said, uh, they said, for example, that um, Sir Arthur Lewis never did anything for St. Lucia, right? But Sir Arthur Lewis did so much for St. Lucia, which St. Lucians don't even know. The whole development of St. Lucia that occurred post-adult suffrage was due to Sir Arthur. Why? Sir Arthur was the economist in the UK and worked a lot for the colonial office. He was the one who actually wrote a hell of a lot on agriculture. And that's why I brought my volumes, the three volumes of all Sir Arthur's writings are here with me. And in it, you will see, you can pass it around, where his writings on agriculture were of great importance, not only for us in St. Lucia, throughout the tropical world. Anyway, coming back to St. Lucia, to give you the story, is that he had written about tropical agriculture throughout the world and identified that Jamaica was the greatest laboratory 
for agricultural development. And the reason for that was because Jamaica had what is known as the Jamaica School of Agriculture that trained local officers and then sent them out to the field to educate the farmers. And he had made the recommendation when we were starting off our banana industry to transfer some of the knowledge that was grown in and Jamaica, because Jamaica had grown bananas before, into St. Lucia. So you had a number of Jamaican agricultural, agriculturally trained guys. You know, maybe know some of them. There was Harry Atkinson, for example. There was Gage, Samuel Gage. There was Stanley Mullins. Uh, Gage Mullins is another one. Stewie, I said Stewie, the Stewarts, Atkinson, and so on. So these are the guys who came and actually taught our farmers how to grow bananas. Okay? So that is the contribution which Sir Arthur has made to his country. All right? which we don't even know about. All right? The other thing about Sir Arthur that I want to tell you about is the Nobel Prize that he got. Uh, and I would like the students here since the school is, na is named after him, this paper here, Economic Development with Unlimited Supplies of Labor, is something which every student of economics in this Alphalis uh, Community College should be aware of. Because that's what gave him the Nobel Prize. And I have a theory now of how the Nobel Prize was conceived. Whether it was conceived directly or indirectly. You know you can have con conception artificial insemination, right? Anyway, when Sir Arthur was a young man at St. Mary's, he was such a bright guy that by the age of 14 or 15, he had written the London examinations, the London matriculation exams and passed. But he was too young. He was too young. To do, he had reached the age for the scholarship. So he had to go to work. So he went to work at the Ministry of Agriculture, at a job known as a copyist. He was a copyist in the Ministry of Agriculture. So he left the little school that you see there by the Anglican Church. And go down, and you see that big building there. It's kind of a little octagonal building in green, which was the headquarters of the Ministry of Agriculture. Because the agriculture started in St. Lucia right there at what you call the Botanical Gardens. Of course, it's not a Botanical Garden now. The gardens was where the Ministry of Agriculture was located, and that is where Sir Arthur had his first job as a copyist. So in there, he had to deal with all sorts of kinds of people, like those of the plantations and so on, and the growing peasantry, the peasants and so on were coming and so on. So that when you read Unlimited supplies of labor. You will see he comes up with the concept of the dual economy. That was the whole thesis, the whole thing. You can read the 
read it and you'll see. That the economy has two heads, so to speak. I wrote two heads. One, the formal economy and the informal economy. And what I'm saying is that that conception of the dual economy must have been at the back of his head as a result of his interactions at that place in the gardens. All right? So the Nobel Prize is due to the existence of that little house that you see, which is still there in the gardens. That is my thesis. For what it's worth. Anyway, how much more minutes I have? Hmm? How many more minutes I have? Okay, well, just let me deal with just one other aspect which I want to deal with. And that is we often we often say, oh, well, we have Sir Arthur and Derek Walcott. But St. Mary's has a hell of a lot more people who have come through that college, okay? In a lot of areas of endeavor. However, I just want, since uh, Mia Motley and them talking about the linkage between the Caribbean and Africa, I'll show you how St. Mary's has contributed significantly to the development of Africa. First of all, we have one of the early guys who got, was in 1890-something, and the just thing, his name was Beausoleil, Dr. Beausoleil, became Dr. Beausoleil, and migrated afterwards to Ghana. And he was a very great doctor. And he came back to St. Lucia, apparently, with a lot of things of plants of medicinal value. But it got, damn it, it got burnt during the fire, and he lost it. All right? That's Dr. Bosole. There was a gentleman, and I told you about... <laughs> It's a rather interesting story, this one. Hunter J. Francois had a brother called George Francois who served in the English army in the First World War. In the First World War. And after the First World War, he went to Ghana and in Ghana, he helped Ghana to be developing cocoa. And he was one of the chief cocoa men in Ghana. And allowed Ghana to become the greatest producer of cocoa in the world. He had a godson in St. Lucia, called Stanley Lewis. Stanley Lewis was the eldest brother of Sir Arthur Lewis and Sir Ali Lewis and Earl Lewis and Pick Lewis, etc. The Lewis clan. So when old man Lewis died, Mistress Lewis was left, you know, well, for all those boys and having to feed them with a lot of bread and so on. It's easy, you know, when these, and, and that's why we have to 
to, to, to praise our single mothers. They are the backbone, the backbone of the economy, whether you like it or not. And so Francois sent for his godson, Stanley Lewis, to Ghana. And help, Stanley Lewis helped him in his cocoa thing. And so they are big name in Ghana. Francois now. And it's very, very interesting. Francois had children, so that is hunters, nephews, and so on, in Ghana. And one of them, a lady, became a chief justice in Ghana. And one of the sons, one of the sons became the chief engineer in the whole of Ghana. So all the roads, the development of the transportation system in Ghana has been done by a derivative of St. Lucia, St. Lucian. All right? As a matter of fact, um, you can, if you, if you go into your Google and you put Hunter Francois and George Francois of St. Lucia, there's a, it'll come up and you'll see the writing, uh, the posting of one of the, George Francois' sons, the one who became uh, uh, the chief engineer, so to speak, of Ghana. All right? Um, one of the boys also was an advisor to Kwame Nkrumah. Now, there was another St. Lucian called, you know, Patterson Land? You all know Patterson Land? Okay. Patterson Land's there by Leslie Land. There was a Patterson son who again got the island scholarship after Arthur Lewis, did languages in England, and then went to teach in Ghana in a place called Achimoto College, which is the famous college in, in Ghana. And he was well respected in Ghana. So that, and also Arthur Lewis was well respected in Ghana because Arthur Lewis was the one who did the first development plan for Kwame Nkrumah, the president of Ghana, immediately after its independence. So that when he, Arthur Lewis, went down there, he already had family. Stanley, his elder brother, was there. So they were well received in Ghana. But coming down to um, the other guy, Patterson. Patterson became very close to Kwame Nkrumah. And he was Kwame Nkrumah's chief advisor. When Kwame Nkrumah, Kwame Nkrumah, Nkrumah was out as the president of Ghana, he went to Guinea. All right? To the president of Guinea called Sikutori. And Patterson also became the chief advisor of the president of Guinea, Sikutori. So you have all these kinds of uh, stories about our own people. Who, of course, you have heard of course, Danny Alexander, who was the chief, uh, chief, um, chief justice of Nigeria. You had Sir Garnet Gordon's brother, who was also in the Cameroons. We had a Glasgow, Rodney Glasgow, the brother's father, uncle, as well. 
in the legal office offices in Ghana. So we have St. Lucians from St. Mary's College, of course, have a lot of connections which have been positive for the development of Africa. So I think I must have said enough. Inspired questions. Only five questions, Mr. Kalik. I suspect we might be here all night if um, we really need to ask you all of the questions, and the answer will be coming to you in, in just a bit. I hope this one is not another lecture, well, yes. but I'm very curious what was the process that you went through for compiling all of that information? Oh, um, <laughs> I told you it took four years for me to do that. Yeah. And um, I had to do a lot of research. But I, I have a, a very good son called Calvin, Calic George Jr., who served as my research. So he had to go to the archives. Oh. Yes, yes. <laughs> go to the archives. So he, um, my, my youngest son uh, was responsible as the research director to go to the archives to get all the things. Because when you look at the book, you will see a lot of detailed, Definitely. a lot of detailed things. It's the references. OK? And so if and a student wants to do um, further studies, it's, 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 it's in a way, it's, it, the book is also encyclopedic in a way. And if students want to um, explore other areas and so on, you get the, the relevant um, uh, uh, right. References and so on, and that was due to my 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 son, of course, under my re direction. Um, probably it's because um, I'm a researcher by nature. Mm -hmm. I, 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 my my whole life has been sent has been spent on on research, research. agricultural research. Yes, sir. We need we need to dock all of that information that is. Well, some of it is in here, but a lot of it. Yeah, you can. Well, well, just some of it. You know, I, I, I couldn't. I could go through. <laughs> yes. If I have to go through this, um, I know for sure it will take me a long time. I cheated a bit. Yeah. Um. So I have. I had gone through the text before, but I hadn't read the epilogue. Uh -huh. And the I have. Epilogue. I have so many questions coming out of just that. Uh, okay. That, <laughs> that we'll have a separate conversation about that. Okay. Um. But let me go to the audience. We. I know we have some students present here, and I want to give them the opportunity to ask any questions if they have. And while they drum up the nerve to put up their hand, I'd like to recognize the principal of St. Mary's College who has joined us. And um, there's something there in the epilogue for you, sir, in order to continue the research. So I'll draw that to your attention. Um, so any questions from the audience? A lot of rich yeah, information yeah, there. Yeah, we yeah. do have a question. Just stand, love, so we can see. Hello? And we okay. You need to stand. And turn this way so we want to make sure the camera the camera gets you. So just come round to the front. Your question is very important to us. Uh, a lot of questions typed out. Uh, how is it to study in areas or even achieve classes in chemistry, botany? What's that? How is it like to, um, in the study, to, sorry. <laughs> How is it to study and accomplish and achieve these classes in chemistry, bot botany, 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 thank you, zoology, in a time where solutions were known for to study and be successful in those areas? Uh -huh. Ask him. <laughs> How was it? He was, he was in my class. We had very, um, <laughs> I will give you all a joke. Students, students, serious thing, really. We must always give students free time. Let them express themselves. Or else, because they guide us along. If I was not a radical student, mm. there would be no Sir Arthur Lewis Community College doing science. All right? When we wanted to do, to do, in the first instance, to get to do the three subjects, the fellows were classical and so on, said, we want to do the allergies, boys. And so himself and myself went to the 
to the to the um, headmaster at the time. Uh, and the headmaster wouldn't allow us to do the three subjects. He said, but we don't make what makes sense. I, I'm not interested in literature and all that kind of thing. I'm interested in science. And he kicked us out of the office. I'll have no suggestions from you and Theodore. That's my partner here. So we wasted a whole year, as he says, because we were just not interested in doing literature. Well, there are other fellows, Kiak um, and, um, and, 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 and Vaughan Lewis. They, 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 they did the literature and so on, but I was not interested in literature. And, and so we plugged in and we say we're not going to do it. We want to do our three science subjects. Right. So after a while, he came down to us and he said, okay, oh, what we had done, he said was impossible. We took the whole um, timetable and we showed him where he could have put in us doing the three things. All right? And then eventually, when he saw that we could do it and showed him how we could do it, then he allowed us to do it. But again, we had some very good um, brother. We had a very good brother called Brother Don, um, Brother Complot Pri Pope Passe Zeb, too, eh? Because we had Brother, what's his name again? Marcus. Brother Marcus. Brother Marcus was with us. So we had the complot on him. But the point I'm making is that you have to allow students to express themselves. Because the expressions, the, 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 you know, the, what, what the, the, their points can have value, a lot of value later on. Huh? Yeah, yeah, we did it. We did. Yeah, we did. Oh, we still had a lot to study then. Yeah, yeah, we studied hard. Congratulations. Well, I have to say, congrats. I know I'm very late, but congratulations. That, that's a great accomplishment. <laughs> <laughs> so I think to, to further expand um, her question, so because you were rebels, one, you were able to just choose the subjects, but I'm, I think she's saying in the time when Caribbean people probably didn't study science, we understand that even South, I was not allowed to study engineering, which was his first right. choice. Yes. What is it about, I don't know, you, the education system that actually made you excel in, in those areas? You just have to work hard, that's all. Okay. Hard work. Just like what Hunter said. Huh? Remember, I remember the thing I gave you about Hunter. Yes. Is the question of the thirst for the knowledge. Okay, even if you don't. So you have to. Discipline, actually, is the discipline that is required for you to be able to. So it's not a rebel without a cause, huh? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. well, in fact, there's a. You remember rebel without a cause? <laughs> James. Jimmy. James Dean, that's right. Yeah. Okay, thank you so Jimmy, much for Jimmy that question. Dean. And um, yeah. we have an old SMC boy here who has the mic in his hand, former lecturer at South Lewis, Mr. Emanuel. Go ahead. Mr. Who? Really Royston Emanuel. Mr. Who? Royston no, Emanuel. It's just Royston. Oh, oh, it's Royston, okay. sorry. Um, oh, I have to turn around. I have to go to the podium. Oh, excuse me. Is the mic on? I think it's on. But I'm not going to stay here for long. So, um, so it's... This is so interesting, and I def I'm definitely going to buy this book because sitting and talking to Winston about how this is a nice amalgamation of oral history, of your own experiences, but a very good metonymy of St. Lucian history as well. And I think that is quite critical. But I just want to say it's easy to paint those histories in a romantic way. You know, people like Camo Graphic make it clear that there is a tendency for, for us to always romanticize our past. And so I have, a very, I have a question that might hit on some nerves, but it's quite important to me. I went to St. Mary's in the 80s, and I had some experiences that, um, to me, were kind of traumatic, because the issue of diversity was not something that was readily dealt with. Either you stepped or you were not seen as part of the ethos of the college. So I, I just want to hear from you, how were the issues of race, diversity, class, dealt with 
during your time at the college? And is that actually something explored in the book? Um, there was minimal, not much to talk about. Um, uh, I don't think that there was any kind of racial overtone. Um, Mark, there any racial thing? Not really. Not really. Everybody's the same. You know, most the most important thing about the college uh, is that it teaches you loyalty, all right? And I believe that that is because of the houses, all right? Every college boy is loyal to his house. He's also loyal to his class, too, you know. Um, if, you, <laughs> if a master, fellas, you know, make, make a noise and so on, you know, um, and the master wants to know who it was that made the noise there and so on. Nobody is going to say yes, you know. Nobody is going to say who it is, you know. That class is just tight. You know, you cannot move the class. Because, of course, you know the college boys, if you do that, you're called a... That is correct. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wondered if I could, if I could just, with your permission, Sir Alex, just respond to a, a treat with Royston's um, question. I have a, a suspicion. I know what you're referring to, and I can, I can attest that there were some um, of my fellow students, 1966 to 72, who um, felt traumatized. Uh, I'm talking about those that came from the country. Um, but that was not a that was not peculiar to St. Mary's, okay? That was that was the situation in the country, which was kind of uh, strange because all of us came from the, some part of the country by virtue of the the, the, the migration from the country into the, into the college. My parents, for example, came from from Denry. My dad from Sozal. and Sufre. and Sufre, right? But they were, they were, they were. I remember Faustin, Desmond Faustin, and these kind of guys who spoke with a very heavy tongue of Mikudian, of Mikudian yes, background. Yes, yes, yes. These the fellows, these, these yes. fellows got a hard time. But yeah, I can yeah. tell you that that was not peculiar. While we were playing marbles in Grass Street, if you dared to speak proper English while you're playing your marbles, and fellows would treat you as being bourgeois. So you had these kind of class things. I, I'm not denying that at all. Um, but the thing about St. Mary's that I found quite, quite um, uh, effectively was that it was an equalizer of class. These, these sentiments of the Faustins and these guys, I mean, if you, if you meet Faustin now, and I, I'm sorry to have to mention a name, but um, these things are dissipated. If, if you were at the St. Mary's College um, old boys thing um, last, last, uh, last March, I mean, th that was just an event that I'll always remember. But I, so, so, Alex, I wanted to go to a point you made about so Arthur standing on the veranda of the old St. Mary's. No, Derek. It was Derek Walcott. Who was the head, well, his head boy? Derek Walcott was standing at the veranda. After the fire? After the fire, yes. Right, and, and looking across the promontory you were speaking about. Right. Looking at the and seeing the charted town, right. the charred town. But interestingly, what he was looking at, I thought, would, as you read it, he was looking at the new site of St. Mary's from the old ah. site. Ah, <laughs> right. Okay, so he was making the transition from old to new uh -huh. on that veranda of the old college. Could be, yes. You know, and seeing the new site. Yeah, yeah. And I thought that 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 little passage there was quite striking for me. Yeah, yeah. I didn't you know? catch it that. Way. Yeah. I was looking at it more from the point of view that he was looking at the chart. Right, yeah. yeah. He's looking past it. Last point I wanted to make with your permission, um, Madam Chairperson. You made the point about agriculture setting the, the, the framework for the development of the country. Mm -hmm. And I think that point is something that's lost on many of our people mm -hmm. from that time. Because all of the estates, the, the infrastructure, that was established for the years for these estates was the infrastructure that was established for the country. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right? So the, all the geese lands, you know, in Denry and Roseau and, and, and all of that, uh, um, the lands in where Atkinson 
Maki. Maki, right? All of these lands, that infrastructure is really what is carrying us today. That is correct. Yeah. You know, and all of the new roads and so on that are built are superimposed on that agricultural infrastructure. Yeah, which as I, a matter I think of fact, quite, um, quite astonishing. When, when I explain, the, the whole of the infrastructure that we have now, including the infrastructure for, um, for, for, for the tourist industry, is derived from agriculture. We had to, as an agricultural officer, we had to justify every single road that was being thing from the British Development Division or USAID, as the case might have been, right? To get the funding. So you have to justify going to thing and say, well, look, the production from that particular, the potential for the uh, production for the particular area will be so many tons and so on, you know? So every single road that we had, for example, going up to places like Debara, you know, going up to Grand Ravine in, in um, thing, Tiobal, all over the country, and especially those going up to Miku, Deriso, and these places had to be justified, right, from an agricultural standpoint. And so the infrastructure that we have now is really on the basis of agriculture. And that is why, and interestingly again, if you go into, in, into uh, Arthur's readings, his writings, he will tell you, in fact, we had this, this whole thing about, and here you'll get it, on the industrialization of the West Indies. But what is central, because he's been misunderstood too, all right? He never had any kind of invitation, um, industrialization by invitation, that's not true. What he was saying is that we could not develop industrial unless you develop concomitantly. Yeah. Both have to go together. Both the agriculture and the industry have to go together. And that is the thesis of the Arthur. Yeah, that's from the old Bosley, it's the old Bosley people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's the old family, old Bosley family. Yeah, yeah, they grow well, yes. You know, um, Sofre is a great cocoa, cocoa, cocoa area. Any other questions? I think... Um, just before you, student, we have the principal of St. Mary's, and then we'll move to the student. Answer. Oh, well, principal of St. Mary's is there? <laughs> well, Good you afternoon. know, I'm very disappointed in St. Mary's. Because the, the, my book, which is the whole essence of St. Mary's College, I don't think more than about one or two of your of your teachers have looked at the book. It's a shame. Anyway, go ahead with your question. Now, now that you've put me on the spot, I will hasten to inform that I do have a copy of the book. Actually, a parent gave it to me as a gift when I came into that the school. That I know, so. sir. Because you, because you that, signed it. And that is in recent times. Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I was appointed on the first of November last year. Yeah. So, yeah. Good day, everyone. Uh, Mr. George, the school is, to my math, 133 years old. No, no, it is going to be 130. 1890. It's, it is born in, nine, it was, yeah, nine, 1890. Right, so, 133 this year, 2023. Yeah. 23, yeah, yeah. 130 years. Yes, at the time of the book. Right. right. And um, your book covered quite a few of those decades. I will say by decade. And during that time, SMC was, in essence, one of the very few educational institutions in St. Lucia, um, convent and so on. Later came FIFA Comprehensive. And you've spoken a lot about the history of the school in terms of um, the, the, for, the fellow Sumerians, old boys, who have contributed in so many different facets of St. Lucian and international life and economy and so on. 
of course, no less than our Nobel laureates as well. My question is, in this current climate where we have different secondary schools, we also have different needs of society, changing needs of society. What role do you see St. Mary's College playing in this current climate now and moving forward? <laughs> now, a lot for my information as well, eh, as I plot the path what, for what, the school moving they, forward. They, they, <laughs> you want me to answer that question? You all, all of you all might want to put me out of there. <laughs> Number one, if you read my book, you will see that I talked about the decapitation of St. Mary's College. I was totally against the sixth form college. Because you cannot tell me that you have a school as great as St. Mary's is today, able to teach to the A level standard. And I put here, and the lady asked, asked a question about how we could do that. When I did my thing there, when we did our thing, that was first year university, you know. The standard was so high at St. Mary's that it was first year university. So that when I went to school, study my, do my science and so on. Cleaners. Cleaners. St. Mary's had taught us to a very, very high standard. And I was dead against the decapitation. In fact, one of the things in the epilogue is that I say that there must be reparations to St. Mary's by putting back, by putting back a sixth form into that. Because the removal of the sixth form at St. Mary's decapitated it to such an extent that at one time, the college was going down to the dogs. Why? The people did not understand the power of the students, the senior students themselves. The senior students who were the prefects they administered and controlled that school. So when you take off your, 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 your powerful industrial management, I would call it, of the school, the school must deteriorate. And that is one of the things that I, and I hope at some stage, that they would send back the sixth form to St. Mary's. Because St. Mary's was at a much higher standard. Much, much higher standard than you ever dream of. That's number one. In relation to this particular college here, I understand, and I'm not sure about it, I told them, that they refuse to allow students in this institution to do economics. For the Cape. Who on earth came to that conclusion from Sir Apple's Community College is ridiculous. It is ridiculous. A college which is named after Sir Arthur Lewis, the world's chief development econ e economist, you telling me you all don't want children from this school to do economics at Cape level? You all are crazy, man. Do we get a chance to respond? You all are crazy. Economics is still offered at South Lewis. Hello? I just said the associate degree level, not at I'm, I'm not level. talking about the associate degree level. I am talking Some about level. the Cape, which is a much higher level than your associate level. <laughs> but you're telling me, I was... The, I was a member of the first board of governors of this college. All right? I was a member of the first board of governors of this college. And I had a problem with certain people in it. Okay? For one thing, there was not a very high standard of entry particularly in the technical wing and so on. 
All right. The A level was of a much higher level than the teacher's training college and all that kind of stuff. And the whole thrust of the college, I felt, should have been more open. They, they, they used the college just as though it was a little primary school. That's how it was run, really. There was no opening of the mind because certain people had come from an instructional line of education rather than an innovative and inquiring mind of education. And the college has suffered from my point of view. As a community college in St. Lucia, the lecturers, the senior lecturers, should be more attuned to some of the things in the society and doing some research, research on certain matters. I'll give you an example. Right now, what is the main problem that we have here in St. Lucia? Huh? Community college, crime. The college, they have the resources, you know. But they don't use the resources. You have people here who could very well be studying those guys at Bordelais, getting the profiles and so on. Where they, their background, where they come from, how their process of schooling and things like that. And research to give us some kind of imperial information, imperial data that would help us to move forward with that crime situation. And until such time that the college actually plays the role that it's supposed to play in these things. Papo spoke out. Right? So I think I've said Mary's enough because I can go that. on and on. And y'all wouldn't want me to say about your college. But, <laughs> we, we're going back to St. Mary's but, College. But, but as far as I'm concerned, you all spinning top in mouth up here. So you you missing your, your the answer to your question. So he was asking you how do you think St. Mary's College is supposed to fit into our current environment, our current situation? Well, I said to bring back the sixth form to St. To, to Mary's College. Mm -hmm. When you bring back the, the, the college, it will come back and you keep on producing her scientists and so on, and her people at a, at, a, at a certain level, not at the stupid low level. Low level associate degree, I'll say, you'll have it. But, drop. Um, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but we can talk about how you want, where, if you want to restructure it and so on. Of course, I have problems with you all too, you know. Let, listen, uh -huh. St. Mary's, you talked about coming up to a certain period. Do you know that when I was writing this book, when I was writing this book, I couldn't get information. I couldn't get information on the last modern period. You know why? Because they didn't record anything. There are no magazines. There are no annual magazines, no reports and so on. I got that did that from annual reports that I got from since when my father was a, 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 was a student at St. Mary's. And just imagine at a period of time when we have modern technology, you know, to record what is happening in the college. You all don't record anything. That is why I made a specific call to Boxill and, and Nkrumah to record what is happening at your college now so that we will have for posterity for those who are coming after us what is going because you can only you see the developed that's why the developed world will always beat us because we do not do our own we have a long we have a great history you know in St. Lucia a tremendous history 
but our own people do not know it. And you all don't even teach them. You have to teach the younger ones what happened before so that they can aspire. Okay. One last um, question from the yes, audience, Ms. Um, Jacobs. You need to face the camera, oh, please. Yeah, I, you, you mentioned something about, I think Officer Royston asked about the diversity, and you mentioned something about um, the problems of people getting their children into the school at some point in time. People um, doing what? People getting, students being able to get admitted, maybe because of lack of means or et cetera, et cetera. I, I, I think I heard a little, but then, in terms of my family history, I'm aware that my great-grandmother had to send her three sons to high school in Barbados. I'm wondering why. I think there was a problem, okay? And I'm talking, my great-grandmother, so these, I'm, ta I'm talking about my great uncle. This would be my great-uncles, yeah. my father's uncles. I think they went to Harrison College. In, yeah, so maybe I, di I you did can mention tell that earlier, why. remember? Yes, but why? Why is that? No, you see, um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, earlier, earlier, the earlier I said earlier, you see, St. Lucia, St. Lucia has always been a second class citizen to Martinique and Barbados. When the French, when the French held us, Martinique was our kind of capital kind of thing. All right. That's where most of the education came. If you're British, Barbados. Because Barbados people were more educated. Our Ill Ill illiteracy rate was something like about 80% or something like that. So it was your 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 parent, your grandparents must have been very rich. Because it was only those families that had money that could afford, if you wanted to, a secondary education for your child, to send them down to Barbados, or in the case of some of the whiter ones down here, to go and so on, who could go to England. And in fact, I showed in the book advertisements from those colleges, right, where you could send your children for a further education. Because there was no secondary education in St. Lucia. So the secondary education in St. Lucia came in 1890. 1890. Yeah. Okay? But a lot of people send their children to Barbados and so on. Could be. Could be. It, 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 it was not uncommon in that ca in, the, in the case. A lot of um, middle class um, Caribbean people sent their children to either um, Harrison or the other one, the other college, the two of them, uh, Combermere. They, 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 yeah, they're yeah. out of prestige. I, man, particularly people who came through the islands um, to work. It, 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 the history is repeated. Antigua was also a center for, 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 the, for that type of thing. And also, ironically, with this was the, uh, the establishment of the Lady Michael um, schools. And um, people sent their children to those schools because they were considered um, the education um, output was higher than other places. So possibly your grandparents may not have thought much of St. Mary's College either. It's, a, it's, it's something that you should get the dates and try to yeah, yeah. clarify because the dates would tell you a lot. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but there were also transfers across the islands too, you know, because some of our, I know fellows from from my from St. Mary's who went to school in GBSS in Grenada. All right, and similarly, there were people from GBSS in Grenada who came to St. Lucia. So you had that kind of crossing for some reason or the other. But I suspect, <laughs> I suspect that it was. I'm not saying that in your case, 
But in the cases that I know where they send them out to Grenada or St. Vincent, is that the guy's hair were kind of deficient, let us put it that way. Or they might have been troublesome or something. So they send them up to another country. One final point, Colonel Calix, I wanted to make, and you hit it um, on the head. Removal of sixth form from St. Mary's College actually had a demoralizing effect on the school. And you, you, you would be surprised where it came from. St. Mary's College had a tradition in football, particularly in the Knockout Cup, mm -hmm. where boys, whether they were a sporting discipline or not, they attended those football matches just to support the school. And when the sixth form went out, the college could not feel and the boys had nothing to look up to. But, and, and I don't think the college could ever feel that a first division team since the sixth form moved out. Okay. And, and the, the other thing about the boys, the, 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 the prefects, the prefects, the senior boys, were respected, you know, by the younger boys. Because a prefect, a prefect gives you a detention for anything, you know. I remember some fellas say, um, Blake's, Blake's giving the fella a double detention for getting too familiar with a prefect. Yeah, exactly, you know, that wow. kind of, that kind of, that kind of thing. So it was a, a, a you know, the, the, the elder boys, they formed a core of discipline, which was kind of nice. Thank you so much, Sir Calix, for sharing with us this afternoon. I think that there might be need for a part two of this. Um, but we, we're really happy that you could join us here today at the South Lewis Community College, licks and all, we take it. Um, and um, we, we are happy that you can really document and, and teach us the importance of, of what it is that, that you did with this text. And I hope not just other schools, um, but as a nation that we really start to document and understand our history and, and let it inform what we do in the future. So I'm not responsible for the official vote of thanks. <laughs> Let me invite Ms. Lorimer Jacobs, one of our communication studies lecturers, to do that. Okay, <laughs> protocol adopted. On behalf of the Hunter J. Fosua Library, the librarian and the college, I thank you sincerely for your, Sir so Calix, I thank you sincerely for responding without hesitation to our invitation to this Author Talks series. Um, indeed, your presence and your participation is more than an honor. And we would all agree that this, that this is more than just a presentation of the chronicles of the, um, the, chronicles of the history of tertiary level education in St. Lucia, your great work. Okay, which I, I mean, I cannot imagine the amount of time, the amount of work, considering the challenges that you had getting data. You know, I mean, this speaks to a labor of love and it, it says a lot about your love for education and the keen interest that you have in the success of our institutions, of our students, um, our human resource in general, our development. Okay. Um, Thank you for giving us a little look into the lives of those education pioneers, you being one of them, a true architect of education in this country. Um, considering that you're from a line of educators, a long line of educators, going back to your great-grandfather, Oscar Simpri, a descendant that I'm proud of. Yeah. Right, thank you <laughs> um, for... Um, being an unapologetic social democrat or democratic socialist? How do you call yourself? <laughs> social democrat? <laughs> um, an agronomist, an anthropologist, a true son of the soil, no pun intended. Um, while listening to your treatise on the role of school and the teaching learning experience in awakening the need and the urgency to know more and to solve problems, 
Um, I recall the work of the prophet by Khalil Gibran. Um, I recall the urgency with which the people beckoned the prophet, the exhortation to him to speak to us. Speak to us about, ch about children, speak to us about knowledge, about marriage, about so many things. Um, and on behalf of every, everyone here, I thank you sincerely and I implore you to return, to return, to come back and continue speaking to us, sharing with us your wisdom. Thank you so much. Thank you. We will just present a token of appreciation. Chair, you wanted to say something before we end? This is uh, quite apart from being a, a friend of my family. Um, we are family. You know. We are family. <laughs> uh, on both sides. <laughs> uh, on all sides, almost. <laughs> um, Sir Calix is uh, a, a mentor uh, and a dear friend of mine. And um, none of the views that he expressed here today um, are, are new to me. Um, he has spoken with great passion today about the importance of our college becoming of the community again, um, which is where we used to be when I was a student here uh, many years ago. Um, we are a community college. We have ties. I, I mean, if, if we were to write the history of the Arthur Lewis Community College, I dare say it would be just as impressive, um, though not as, as stellar as St. Mary's, but we have made our contribution as well as a college. Um, I would imagine that three out of every five graduates of the University of West Indies pass through Sir Arthur Lewis Community College. Of course, many of them pass through St. Mary's on their way, <laughs> on their way here, um, but we've played our role. Um, but the point that Sir Calix made about the college being immersed in research is one that I take wholeheartedly. Uh, I want to send out a clarion call. And I know that many of us here know that uh, uh, Kurt Harris, Dean Harris, and, and, and uh, Dr. Fulgence of that mind as well. We really have to make the community aware, St. Lucia aware, that we have the caliber of faculty here at our college who can contribute meaningfully to solving some of the problems that we're facing as a country now. And we have to make, make that a, a target of our work. It has to be in our work plan. We have to encourage at least every faculty member to write a research paper, not on any esoteric theme, but on a theme that is of germane importance to the development of our country. If we can do that, I think then all of our St. Lucia will come to see us as a true beacon on the hill, right? where we are making a stellar contribution to the development of our country. That is the charge that I, I hear Sir Alex, uh, Sir Calix putting out, which I enjoy, which I support. Uh, th there's a one point that he made that I, I feel um, education evolves. And just as we move from GCE to CXC, you know, we have moved to the associate degree. Now, that is, for me, uh, and I took a conscious decision with my daughter. When I thought about it, and I thought about her spending two years here at Sarata, um, when she could have spent those two years contributing to a, a full degree, right? Which is a four-year degree in the United States, three-year in, in thing. It made sense to me to push her directly into a full degree. Now, at the time, the associate degree here was not fully developed. But if that was an option at the time, I might have considered it. So the thing for me, though, from the comment you've made, is that all of our offerings here at Sir Arthur have to be, first of all, relevant. They have to, uh, secondly, be of the highest excellence. Okay. So for me, the issue is not the, the, the level of 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 qualification that you get is the excellence, as you said earlier in your piece, how prepared it makes you, the skills that it gives you, the curiosity, right? 
and so on, so that you want, you want to contribute. So I want to close it there. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, but to close again, I can't thank you enough for the presentation you've made today for the book. Um, I, I hope our students and, and our faculty here uh, sees now of the need for us to put our shoulder to the wheel, roll up our sleeves, and really make this place Sir Arthur Lewis Community College a place that is uh, carries the. I'm, I'm trying to find the words because I'm trying to get. A, I'm getting a little emotional as you might, you might, but this 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 place on the hill that we occupy, friends. I've said this to you before. I cannot think of any other educational institution in the Caribbean that is as blessed as we are to have this place. And we now have to make it the best place that it can be for education in the Caribbean. Thank you. You want me to make a... Uh, uh, I, I know this is the end, but uh, I just want to make a comment on that particular point that you raised there. Um, we have to be able to boost up ourselves, ourselves. This institution can become a world-renowned institution if we do the pursue the correct pathways. As far as I'm concerned, you see Barbados, Cave Hill Compass in Barbados drives the whole economy of Barbados. And similarly, this institution on the hill can do the same. However, we do not have the resources to have a full-fledged university giving all kinds of faculties, et cetera, et cetera. But we have enough staff. There's, there's enough highly qualified staff in this institution for us to move forward. We have highly qualified staff, more highly qualified staff here than when the University of the West Indies, UWE, was here. We have to be able to mobilize them. How we do that? We convert this place into a university, but it must be a specialized university that will attract people throughout the world. You have the name of the university. So you have to have this as a center for development economics. Because that is where the father of development economics comes from. So we have to train our guys, our economists, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah. Now, one of the reasons why Sir Arthur was so brilliant was that he did not take pure economics as such. You know, there's the question of the people factor, the sociological factor. So between economics, development economics, and sociology, you have to give that degree. That's number one. Not a associate degree. I'm talking about a full degree. Number two, you have at this place says what what is this place called? Caribbean Environmental. Huh? You have to give a course a degree in environmental science as a degree. But it is crafted in such a way that it can fit into your agricultural base. Because there's very little difference between environmental science and agricultural science when you come to think of it. So you can give a degree in environmental science where when you come to your final year, you can branch off whether you want to do you know, public health or whatever it is, 
at least. Again, springing from the fact that you had an environmental science institution, which is where we are, isn't it? And the next one, which I think that is the truth, is one dealing with education. All right? How you structure it, you have to structure it in such a way that it is kind of broad to cover a whole set of things. Right? In education, because you have no country can develop properly without a pure educational base. Okay? And finally, you need to have one which, um, uh, what's your name again? The, the dean here, my friend, who was, who was trained in, in telecommunications, really. Good. Uh, kind of engineering, broad engineering degree that could cover things. So if you have that, and just you don't need to do any more. Just four. Just four degrees coming out from this college. But they're specialized degrees and fitted to your environment. Okay? Thank you. Thank you so much. Let me invite Sham to, to make a presentation to Mr. George. To Sir Calix, my apologies. Sir Calix George, on behalf of the Hunter G. Fasois Library, as well as the South Lewis Community College, and I'm glad that the principal of SMC is still here because based on your contribution, I'd like to say the thanks of SMC is in it too. On behalf of all the institutions, especially SMC, and as a relatively young old boy myself, on behalf of myself, we'd like to thank you with this token of appreciation. Thank you. <laughs> Again on Friday, this Friday at the same time, one o'clock, and our author this time will be Rick Wayne. We invite you back here for again, just elevating conversation and a lot of information that you can use um, to help develop our country. Congratulations to the Hunter J. Faswa Library, celebrating National Libraries, Library Week and uh, pushing the envelope. Thank you so much, get home safely, and we'll see you on Friday. Oh, there are some refreshments outside. Please join us. <laughs>